<laughs> um, so let's go ahead and start. Um, we got an awesome speaker today. I don't want to introduce him yet, but I will in just a moment. Um, I want to ask everybody uh, to, to hang around um, after David's done for just a minute or two. There's a couple of things I want to go over. Um, so um, I want to talk about band real quick. And then I got another thing I want to jump on there about. And it'll only take a minute or two. So if you guys hang around, I would really appreciate it. Um, my, and in preparation of that, my email, um, our host is going to put uh, over in chat. So if you go over to the chat, click on the chat button down there, the host is going to uh, put my email address down there. And uh, it's going to be important about what I talk about later. So if you guys want to go ahead and copy that down so you have it, um, that would be great. Um, so let me go ahead and introduce David. Uh, David's our speaker today. He's going to, uh, he's got some awesome stuff to talk to us about. David Uten is the founder of Restoration Bible Ministries. Uh, he's been a part of the Hebrew Roots movement since 2003. The purpose of Restoration Bible Ministries is to help people understand the Bible. And man, do we need some help understanding it sometimes. Teaching the Bible is the heart of David's ministry. David and his daughter, Autumn, and I'm a huge fan of Autumn. He'll tell you that. Um, they work together as a worship team. Uh, they've been working together uh, since Autumn was three years old. That's incredible, huh? David also works with, with the great passion play in Eureka Springs uh, here in Arkansas. So if you guys have never been to the, the great passion play, uh, you should put it on your bucket list. Uh, it really is incredible. I've been over there a couple times now, um, and the place is just incredible. So put it on your bucket list uh, so you guys can go and uh, check that out someday. But um, okay, I want to turn it over to David. David. Hey, sir. Sure is nice to be here with everybody. And uh, I'm going to uh, share my screen here and see if we can get so everybody can see the slides. And so looks like we're good there. So uh, what we're going to be talking about today, guys, is the seven everlasting covenants. And uh, I'm going to tell my testimony a little bit and why I think that this has been a significant uh, finding for me in scripture. So when I was in my 20s, I wound up being out of church for three months when I was with a drum and bugle corps. And it was a period of my life when I was trying to figure the world out and it really wasn't making sense to me I was really kind of confused but when I was uh, gone for those three months dad said well you should read the bible while you're gone since you're going to be out of church and I was like well okay I've got 63,000 miles on a bus to read I thought well that's a good plan so um, like every good believer I started in the book of Daniel because I thought, well, that's a good book of stories and Daniel and the lion's den and all that kind of stuff. And so when I started reading Daniel, I had not a clue. I didn't know who Nebuchadnezzar was. I didn't know what the temple vessels were. And then when I got to the ram and the goat business, I was as lost as a goose in a hailstorm. And I kind of felt at that point, you know, I've been in church 20 years, and I know absolutely nothing about the Bible. So I decided to start in Genesis and read the Bible slow and see if I could begin to understand a little bit. And by the time I got through the end of the book of Revelation, after reading the entire Bible for three years, I was still lost. It just wasn't making sense to me. I, you know, I saw what was there, but I really didn't get it. And there was a certain point when I was teaching uh, Bible at a Christian school, the, basically the third time that I taught Genesis, I began to understand the Bible a little bit. And uh, in kind of a simplistic mindset, I saw Abraham as the first Christian, quote unquote, 
And uh, now the I began I began to see a situation where uh, there was a pattern that God would create, Satan would corrupt, and then God would judge it and have to restore it. And I saw that pattern over and over until I see I saw God get with Abraham and make covenant with Abraham and pour all of his goodness into this man, including that he was going to bring the Messiah through Abraham. Now I began to have something that I can go, okay, now I'm beginning to understand what's going on a little bit. And that was the beginning of a long journey. That was back in 1984 when I began reading and in 87, 88, when I kind of started putting things to, together a little bit. But I continued to study and continued to study. And finally, I came to a conclusion after studying the Bible a long time that what is foundational is that the creator of the universe has made covenant with a rebellious group of people on the planet in order to restore them instead of destroy them. And I was like, okay, now that's something that I can start making sense with. And I think it's also something that guys can relate to because guys know how to make deals. They understand deals. They see when God has come to man to make agreement with them and say, this is what I'm going to do. This is what you're going to do. And this is how our relationship is going to function. So I began seeing the value of covenants. And in researching the covenants, I began to notice that there were everlasting covenants. So I began to kind of look at the everlasting covenants. And it was a little bit difficult to study. And we're going to find out why shortly. But the question is, when God says something is an everlasting covenant, does that mean it's an everlasting covenant? And I'm at the point in my life where I say, yes, when God says something is an everlasting covenant, that means it's an everlasting covenant. So I began looking at this and I began realizing why I was so confused about everything in life, you know, and why I was confused as a teenager and, and working through trying to make sense of my world. And that's when it really kind of dawned on me that it seems to me that society really kind of has a plan to harm us in the sense of, you know, we have <clears throat> the whole debate about creation versus evolution. And it seems like the world is doing everything it can to basically destroy our faith. You know, I, I am so firmly rooted in the belief that God is the creator of the universe. I just don't have any issues in, with it at this point. But when you go to university, um, they're putting Greek philosophy into you instead of the God of the Hebrews. That's what all the fraternities are about. That's what all the philosophy classes are about. It's about Greek thought. It's about what these men thought. I'm not as interested in what men think as I am interested in what God thinks. And I think that's the way we have to look at it. And we'll see in our world that there has become a situation where it's sacred versus secular. You know, we want to have a sacred worldview. We want to view the world through the Bible. We don't want to view the world through the lens of ancient pagan philosophers. We want to look at the world from God's standpoint. But there's another issue as well that sometimes the church has also added to the confusion. And I think that there was a situation back in the 300s and 400s when they began to, and this is um, AD, when they began to canonize the Bible, they took an approach that I really wish they hadn't of. 
and they they put some books into what we call the Old Testament and some books into what we call the New Testament. They had the Apocrypha as well. And it kind of gives the idea that there's only an Old Testament and a New Testament. There's only an Old Covenant and a New Covenant. And that's just not really the way it works. The Old Testament or the Old Covenant is the covenant that was made at Mount Sinai, but it's not all of the books before the Gospels. It just doesn't work that way. And the New Testament isn't just the covenant from the Gospels on. There are multiple covenants in there. There are multiple ever everlasting covenants. In fact, there's seven everlasting covenants. And we're going to look at those covenants today and see the importance of it. So we do not want a situation where it's new versus the old and they are in conflict with each other because God is not divided. And we see that, um, that that's kind of what happened is people divided God. And uh, that is not what Yeshua told us, but that's what has been happening since, uh, you know, this is uh, one of the early printings of the uh, King James Bible. And, uh, you know, and you can see that they divided it containing the books of the old and the New Testament. This is way back in the 1600s. And uh, most every single English Bible divides into the old and the new. But what did Yeshua say? In John 10, 30, Yeshua said, I and my father are one. And that's the fundamental principle of the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. That Yeshua is not separated from his father. He and his father are one. And all of the everlasting covenants work together as a unified whole. So that's what we're going to talk about is the fact that the Bible does function as a unified whole. It is not split in two as the tradition has been since the Bible was canonized. And when we see the Bible as being a unified whole, then it makes sense how it works together. So we're going to jump into it. And as you see, I've got a graphic here of the seven everlasting covenants and I have them numbered. But the concept that I'm showing you here is that all of the everlasting covenants are a revelation of the covenant from the foundation of the world. And the covenant from the foundation of the world is represented in the first seven words of the Bible. And uh, I don't have a slide on this, but I'm going to give you what I believe is the covenant from the foundation of the world. The covenant from the foundation of the world is that God created the earth as a house for the son of God to take a bride, and he would be responsible for that bride, even if it cost him his very life, because he is the one who would be nailed to connect heaven and earth. Now, that is a, another teaching in itself, but basically what we can see uh, in the covenant from the foundation of the world is the gospel message from the very beginning. But we're going to go ahead and jump in, and this teaching starts with the mystery of seven, because you will see sevens all throughout the Bible. You will see, and and if you don't understand what they mean, it's like, oh, look, there's another seven. But there is a significance because in the Bible, numbers are themes. They have a meaning. It's just God's way of taking this theme and starting it at the beginning and taking it all the way through the end. And it is a constant theme. And if you think of numbers as themes, then they make sense. And the number seven is the theme of covenant, as we're going to see.
So here are your first seven Hebrew words in scripture. Breshit, bara, Elohim, et, hashimayim, bayet, haharetz. Okay, so the question is, why did God start the Bible with seven Hebrew words? Was that an accident? And the answer is, of course not. God doesn't do things by accident. So if God started the Bible with seven Hebrew words, he had a person, uh, a purpose in it. So we're going to find out what it is. And in Genesis 21, 22 through 32, Abraham is going to teach us what seven means. Because uh, Abraham is going to meet a Philistine king named Abimelech, and they're going to make a covenant together. And what we're going to find out is there was a quarrel between Abraham and Abimelech's men. And Abimelech's men violently took away a well that Abraham had dug. And uh, Abraham was not happy about it. So in uh, verse 22, it says, and it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, the chief captain of his host, uh, came to Abraham saying, God is with thee in all that thou doest. Now, therefore, swear unto me here by God that thou wilt not falsely deal falsely with me, nor with my sons, nor with my son's sons. And Abraham agrees. He said, I will swear. And uh, Abraham reproved Abimelech because of a well of water, which Abimelech's servants had violently taken away. And uh, I'm going to say this in English instead of the old English. And uh, Abimelech basically says, I haven't heard about this. You didn't tell me about it, but till today. All right. So this is the well that uh, they were fighting over. This is the well that Abraham dug. And it's in where we call, a lot of people say it, Beersheba. And that well still exists to this day. In fact, you can see how much this well has been used by all the grooves that are going down through the, the rocks. Because, I mean, this well has been used for millennia. And it says that Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them unto Abimelech. And both of them made a covenant. But there's one thing specifically that happens that gives us the lesson we're looking at. It says, and Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, what is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs, which you have set by themselves? Okay, now Ab uh, Abimelech is asking a very important question. He's asking, what does seven mean? But he's asking it in terms of what Abraham did. What are the seven ewe lambs that you have set off by themselves? And Abraham answers, um, and I, I got a, apparently I'm missing a slide. He answers that basically for these seven ewe lambs that I've set by themselves are a witness that I have dug this well. And, um, and they make covenant there. And it says, wherefore, he called that place Beersheba, because there they swear, both of them. Thus, they made a covenant at Beersheba. Okay, now this is very significant. It says, then Abimelech rose up and Phicol, the captain of his host, and they returned to the land of Philistines. Why this is the, what I think one of the most important scriptures in all the Bible is because it explains what seven means, okay? It says, wherefore they called the name of that place Beersheba because they swear both of them. Okay, so we're going to explain why they called the name of the place Beersheba. Because in Hebrew, the same word that means to swear, as in the act of making a covenant, is the same word as the number seven. Now, if you look closely at the slide, you will see that the vowels are slightly different and the pronunciation is slightly different. To swear is Shabbat, 
and the number seven is Sheva. But they both have the same Hebrew letters. They both have the letters Shen, Bet, and Ayan. But it's, it is a Hebrew play on words. And it's very similar in our world to the word close and close. They're both spelled C-L-O-S-E. And the only way you know what the use of the word is, is how it's used in a sentence. And the sentence that I usually use is, he was close to the door, so I asked him to close the door. That is a similar play on words, except in the Hebrew, the seven and the word to swear, which is the act of making covenant, are the same word. That's why the swearing or making of a covenant and the number seven is the same thing. And it is this word, Shiva. All right. So Beersheba means the well of the seven or the well of the swearing. The uh, B-E-E-R part means well. And then Shiva means swearing. And uh, it says, uh, verse 32 tells us, thus they made a covenant by swearing that thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. And so Abraham is telling us what seven means. So when you see a seven in the Bible, it means the theme of covenant. I have a little map so you can see where uh, Beersheba is, and it's down in the south. And Abraham spent a lot of time in Beersheba, down in the south of Israel. And you can go to Beersheba and you can actually see Abraham's well there. They know which one it is, and it has a building that takes care of it all the time. You can actually go see the well of the swearing in Beersheba. And if you go there, you will see this sign that tells the story of uh, Abraham digging and making the covenant there. So what is the mystery of seven? When you see a seven in the Bible, God is his affirming his covenant from the foundation of the world represented by the first seven words in Genesis. So the covenant from the foundation of the world, once again, is the is revealed in the seven everlasting covenants. God has given us these everlasting covenants through time. And when you put them all together, you get the covenant from the foundation of the world. And we're going to explain that a little bit more. But I'm going to give you the definition of the covenant from the foundation of the world one more time. That God created the earth as a house for the son of God to take a bride and he would be responsible for that bride, even if it cost him his very life, because he would be slain, he would be nailed to connect heaven and earth. All right, so we're going to keep going here. And just remember that seven equals covenant. All right, so we're going to go quickly through the seven everlasting covenants. One of the reasons that it's difficult to find them uh, is you kind of have to look into the Hebrew. You have to look under the hood because the King James translators and some of the other translators of the Bible who miss this concept of seven meaning covenant kind of uh, threw us off a little bit. So here we go. We're going to start with talking about the seven everlasting covenants. And why is it important? Is because the plan of God is revealed in the everlasting covenants. All right, so moving forward here. Uh, let's see, I guess I'm gonna go back one more time for you to see that. There are the covenants that I'm about to show you. The covenant of the heavens and the earth, the covenant with Noah, the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with David, the new covenant, the covenant of the thunders, which I'll explain, and then the covenant of peace. All right, so moving forward here. We're going to start with the covenant of the heavens and the earth. And uh, what is the covenant from, of the heavens and the earth? It is the six days of creation and Sabbath. 
And so we're going to see that right now that um, in Exodus 31, 16, we're going to see the token of this covenant. It says, wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe a Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. Now, that is the way that the King James translators translated it. But, but gentlemen, it is everlasting covenant. So the best they could do to make their theology line up is call it a perpetual covenant, but it's not a perpetual covenant, which is different from an everlasting covenant. The Hebrew is Brit Olam, which is translated everlasting covenant almost everywhere else. But the King James translators decided to use the word perpetual covenant because they were doing their best to make their theology line up with what they believe. Um, in the next verse, we'll see that God tells us it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. Now there, the word forever is used where it before instead of everlasting it was known as perpetual and um and we're gonna and we're gonna explain it see the same thing happened even um worse with the the niv translation the israelites are to observe the sabbath celebrating it for their generations to come as a lasting covenant instead of everlasting. Why didn't they use everlasting? I think that in a later version of the NIV, they changed it to everlasting. But when they first translated it, they used lasting covenant. And the reason is, here was the error that they made. They thought Sabbath was the sign of the covenant that was made at Mount Sinai. They didn't realize the covenant of the heavens and the earth and Sabbath being the sign of that covenant. But as we saw before, I'll go back, it says a sign between me and the children of Israel and then it gives the standard for in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So there is an association between the six days and the Sabbath and it very much says in the Hebrew, an everlasting covenant. So that's why we don't change the words in the Bible to match our theology. We change our theology to match the Bible because when God calls something an everlasting covenant, it's an everlasting covenant. He's not wrong in what he's doing. So let's keep going here. Once again, this is the Hebrew, Brit Alam. It is everlasting covenant. All right, now we're going to look at the covenant with Noah. And once again, it's going to use the same words. It's going to use Brit Olam. It's going to use everlasting covenant, except this time they got it right. And uh, it says, uh, and the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it that I remember thee, my, I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And this is the correct terminology. Noah's covenant was an everlasting covenant. And the rainbow was the sign or token of that covenant that when God sees the rainbow, he remembers his everlasting covenant that he's not going to destroy all flesh with water. That was the promise associated with this everlasting covenant. But there it is, Brit Olam, everlasting covenant. And uh, God said unto Noah, this is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And this is in Genesis chapter nine, as you can see. So this one, the translators got correct. Once again, Brit Olam. This time they, they actually did translate it correctly. All right, now we're going to look at the covenant with Abraham. 
And as we're going to see, the covenant with Abraham is also an everlasting covenant. So it says, and we'll get the scripture reference in a second, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy, thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant. Once again, a Brit Olam, correctly translated at this point. To be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And this is Genesis 17, 7. It uses the words everlasting covenant. And uh, once again, if God says it's an everlasting covenant, I'm going to believe him. And it says, and I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all of the land of Cana for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So once again, the covenant of Abraham is the covenant of the land and the seed, and it is an everlasting covenant. It says that it is an everlasting covenant. All right, so keep in mind that the it being the covenant of the land and the seed is very significant. So we're going to keep going. Now we're going to look at the covenant at Sinai, uh, which is called the Old Covenant. And by the way, this one is not called an everlasting covenant. So we're going to read in Exodus 24. It says, and he took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And the answer is, yeah, right. That may possibly have lasted 15 minutes that the, all that the Lord said they will do. But it's unlikely that it even made it that far knowing mankind. And uh, but you notice, uh, let's go to the the next slide here. It says, and Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. And I want you to see what is missing. It doesn't say, behold, the blood of the everlasting covenant, which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. It just calls it the covenant. And the reason is, is because the people are going to make a statement, which they needed to make. They needed to tell the Lord that we'll do what you said. That was important, but they were not going to be able to fall through, follow through with it. Also, in, as we know, what we call the Torah, and we'll talk about that in a minute, with the covenant at Mount Sinai were cursings. And cursed if you don't do this, cursed if you don't do that, and cursed if you don't do that. The cursings cannot go into eternity. In fact, that's one of the reasons the Messiah had to die was to take on our cursings that we had agreed to in this covenant. But this covenant couldn't be an everlasting covenant in its form. And that's why it is just called a covenant. So, but it's still part of God's plan because the Torah is sometimes translated as law. Uh, instructions are sometimes, I believe, a better interpretation of it. But um, we'll see, it says, and the Lord said unto Moses, uh, get up to me into the mount and, um, and, and I will give thee tables of stone and a law. That word right there, law, is the word Torah and commandments, which I've written, that thou may teach them. So we have the giving of the Torah. It's given in a covenant, but is not given as an everlasting covenant. And by the way, the sign of the giving of the law at Mount Sinai was not Sabbath, but the King James translators, the NIV, NIV translators thought that Sabbath was the sign of the covenant at Mount Sinai. So they had to get rid of Sabbath if they thought it wasn't an everlasting covenant. They couldn't understand, you know, if this covenant was not an everlasting covenant, then Sabbath can't be everlasting. 
And so they couldn't correlate the two. They couldn't quite get it to work because they missed the concept that seven means covenant and that there is a covenant of the heavens and the earth, the covenant of creation with Sabbath as that sign that is an everlasting covenant. So they were doing their best to make the Bible match up theologically, but you don't do it by changing the word of God. You let the words of God be the words of God. If he says it's an everlasting covenant, it's an everlasting covenant. You don't have to correct him in your translations. Torah, that is what was given at Mount Sinai, his instructions, his law. And that is significant. So with Abraham, we have the covenant of land and seed. And with Mount Sinai, we have the covenant associated with the law of God or his Torah. Now we're going to get get to the next everlasting covenant. We're going to look at the covenant with King David. And it is an everlasting covenant. In 2 Samuel 23, 5, it says, although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant. Okay, so we know, and this is King David talking, and so we know that the covenant of the king was an everlasting covenant. So the covenant with David is everlasting. The covenant with Abraham was everlasting, but the covenant of the law was not everlasting. However, with these three covenants, the covenant with David, the covenant at Mount Sinai, and the covenant with Abraham, we have the covenants of the kingdom. And, and that's the message that Yeshua came. He came preaching the kingdom of heaven. And so those were the covenants of the kingdom of Israel. He gave them a king. He gave them a law. He gave them land and descendants. Those are the elements that you need to have a kingdom. So continuing on, now we're going to look at the new covenant. Because this is very, very significant what the new covenant is and how it relates to the covenant of the law. So uh, this is in Jeremiah. Now, the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Okay, and this is in Hebrews 13, 20. So the covenant, the new covenant is called in Hebrews, the everlasting covenant and is through the blood of the Messiah, not the blood of the, of the bulls that was talked about at, with the covenant at Mount Sinai, but with the blood of the Messiah himself. And it is an everlasting covenant covenant and um and it and like say jeremiah talks about and i will make an everlasting covenant it is a brit olam with them that i will not turn away from them to do good but i will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me and that is jeremiah 32 40 and uh, the new covenant given in Jeremiah chapter 31 is, um, is going to be explained in verse 33. It says, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law, my Torah, in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. All right, so now we're getting back to the Torah, but what's going to be done is the Torah is going to be put in the inward parts and written on their hearts. And yes, the Messiah is going to die their death, so there is no curse. The cursings fell on the Messiah. Now we have a covenant of the law that can go into eternity and can be everlasting because the messiah died our death 
he took our punishment upon himself, and now he himself writes his laws in our inward parts and upon our heart. And the word is Torah T, and it is my Torah. So how does the Torah become everlasting? Through the new covenant, through the blood of the Messiah, through the death of the Messiah. He is why the Torah is everlasting, because that is the word that is used, Torah T, my Torah. Okay, and here's where it talks about Yeshua making this covenant. Likewise, also the cup after supper saying this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. So here's where we have the Messiah saying that his blood was shed as the blood of the new covenant on our behalf. So the new covenant is the covenant of the law. It's the covenant of the Torah. It is the covenant where the Torah is written on our hearts and it is affirmed at, with the blood of the Messiah and he died our death to get forgive us of our sins and iniquities. And this is how the Torah becomes an everlasting covenant because it's done through the new covenant. Okay, now we're going to talk about the covenant of the thunders. And this covenant is in Revelation chapter 10. And what you're going to see in Revelation chapter 10 is, well, this, and I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head, his face were as the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. Now, when you see this angel come down from heaven and he's clothed with a cloud and he's got a rainbow above his head, you're immediately supposed to remember the covenant of Noah because there's definitely a connection here. And, um, and so we're going to, so you're going to think, okay, the rainbow, that's the token of the everlasting covenant with Noah. So what is going to happen here? It said, and he had in his hand a little book open and he said his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth, okay? So since this is the book of Revelation, he's, he is, this is Yeshua as the lion instead of the lamb. And when he had uh, sounded seven thunders, uttered their voices. So here is where the angel with the rainbow above his head comes down and he makes this covenant. Now, the, the question is, why does he set his feet upon the land and upon the sea? It's because that's where the beasts in Revelation come out of. They come out of the land and the sea. He is getting dominion. And it says, the angel, which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand toward heaven. And look what he's going to do. And swear by him that liveth forever. All right, so we have the seven from the swearing again, and he sweareth by him that liveth forever and ever. Therefore, he, this is Yeshua making an everlasting covenant based on the eternalness of God himself. And it says he swears by him that lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and the things therein and the earth and the things therein. And we're, we're going to see what he does here. And uh, the sea and the things that are in which there and are that there should be time no longer. Okay. The better interpretation is no more delay. A lot of people take this where it says time no longer and says, see, we're not going to have time. Um, but that's not what it means. Because what he is doing, he's answering the question of the martyrs, how long, O oh Lord, do you avenge our death? And basically, the answer is, I'm making this covenant. There's not going to be any more delay. I'm about to avenge your death. So that is the uh, covenant of the thunders. And we're going to see that in, um, in context here in a little bit. Now we're getting to the seventh 
everlasting covenant. And I call it the covenant of the new heaven and the new earth. It is called the covenant of peace. And um, we're going to see this in Ezekiel 37. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant. It is a Brit Olam. Okay. And I will place them and multiply them. And I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. So that's Ezekiel 37, 26. So he's talking about a covenant, an everlasting covenant. They call it the covenant of peace. And it is an everlasting covenant. It is the seventh everlasting covenant. And uh, when do we have the sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore? That happens in Revelation 21. It says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will be with them and he sh and they shall be his people and God himself uh, shall be with them and be their God, which is the plan the whole time. And so we're getting to the everlasting covenant of peace, which is one of the reasons that I believe that we as believers, when we see each other, we say shalom, because that's where we're going to the covenant of peace. So this is the seventh covenant that completes the covenants that reveal the covenant from the foundation of the world. So the covenants are the covenants of the heaven and the covenant of the heavens and the earth, the covenant with Noah, the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with David, the new covenant that is uh, corresponds to the old covenant, and the covenant of the thunders, and the covenant of peace. Now you'll see a little pattern that's going on here, and I have a somewhat of an implication of what that pattern is, but we're going to go into it more in detail in a minute. The covenant from the foundation of the world. This is one of my favorite scriptures in Matthew 25, 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Okay, so the kingdom for the people was the plan of God from the very beginning. How did he have to do that? He had to die for his people, which he did, but the kingdom was prepared for his people from the foundation of the world. Okay, so once again, here are our covenants, and my belief is that all of the everlasting covenants reveal the covenant from the foundation of the world. And so we're going to go over these real again, because it works in the pattern of light and uh, in the pattern of the menorah. We're going to look at that. So uh, this then is the message which you have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And this is in first, first John. So God is defining himself for us in the pattern of light. And this is the way that I believe it works. This is the pattern of light where you have the seven colors of the rainbow. And all of these seven colors actually come out of the white light. When you see seven, there is actually an eighth. And here's how it works. When you put white light through a prism, you see inside the white light and you see all of the seven colors that are in light. That is not an accident. God knew this pattern from the very beginning. And I always ask the question, when you see the rainbow, are you seeing seven bands of light or are you seeing white light through a prism? And the answer is yes, you're seeing both. You are seeing the seven bands of light, and but you're seeing white light through a prism. So the white light 
is like the everlasting covenant or the covenant from the foundation of the world that is revealed in all of the seven everlasting covenants. So uh, it follows the pattern of the menorah, like having the seven colors and the base representing the white light that supports all of the seven everlasting covenants. And as we know, the menorah is in the tabernacle and it's the seven lamps before the throne of God. Here is a picture of white light uh, through a prism imposed over the menorah. And you also see the primaries. You see the red, green, and the blue, the three primary colors. And you see the seven bands of light that we visible all are a revelation of the white light. And so let me see if I can get this. There we go. So here is the pattern of the menorah with the seven everlasting covenants. The new covenant is the foundational covenant, is the physical execution of the everlasting covenant from the foundation of the world. And it is, uh, it is uh, juxtaposed to the covenant of the law. They work together. You have the covenant of the heaven and the earth creation, and it is connected to the covenant of peace, which is the covenant of the new heavens and the new earth. You have the rainbow covenant of all, with all flesh, Noah, connected to the covenant of the thunders, which was given by the rainbow angel in Revelation chapter 10. And the token for those covenants is the seven bands of light or the seven colors. The sign for the covenant of peace and the covenant of new heavens and earth is the seventh day or the Shabbat. Then you have the covenants of the law, the land and seed with Abraham tied to the covenant with King David, supporting the law and the new covenant upholding all. So these are the covenants of the kingdom. And the sign is the uh, circumcision of the heart and circumcision of the flesh, but it's also the generations because there's seven generations from Abraham to Moses, seven generations from Moses to David, and 42 generations from Abraham to Yeshua. So you can see how all of the covenants work together as a unified whole. The new covenant is not separate from those covenants, the new covenant upholds all of those covenants. And that is a huge difference. And that is a huge way of thinking that has been missed when we pit the old versus the new. They don't work against each other. All of the covenants work together as a unified whole. Okay, so uh, Randy, I'm going to turn it back over to you at this point. If you want to do a Q&A, I'd certainly be happy for that. Yeah, absolutely. We definitely want to do that. So if you guys think of your questions, because I know you've got some, um, but I want to, I got a question for you right quick. Okay. That if, if um, we're going to stop, we're going to stop our recording for one second and restart it. So we have two, two separate recordings here. So I'm just going to say stop.